you're probably wondering why you're here. Well, let's cut to the chase. Let me help you with that. It's a nice phone. Even nicer picture of your baby. 1989 Chevy Celebrity. It's beautiful, isn't it? Well, you have to do something for us, or else you'll be buried in this car. Crushed. Do you understand? We'll crush you, your dreams, and your car all in one. Let me help you out. Bend forward. Yes, yes, perfect. You look like a little monkey. That's what I like to see. It's simple, really. Excellent. Since you're so familiar with GM cars, you should have no problem reviewing this masterpiece. All right, we're gonna take that gag out of your mouth now. No funny stuff, no screams, or they're not gonna find nothing but your jeans. What is more masculine than this GMC Yukon? This thing looks like that guy in the back of the gym just pumping iron taking selfies. It is so muscular looking, it is so brutish, that it's hard to kind of see it as anything other than just a monster. You have this big frontal area, big grill. You have HID headlights with LED accents. You have a 20 inch wheel tire combo on this model with two 75 series tires, which are Continentals. Uh, the whole proportions of this car, this truck are just big. There's no way around it, but that's, that's what it's about. It's about hauling, it's about maximum cargo space. It's about towing. It's about throwing as much crap inside of this thing as possible. You know, and it's more of the same along the back. Uh, LED taillights, and even the remote for the car is big. But it handles everything that you want it to do. It has an electric lift back gate, uh, which is a little slower than I would like, but also goes down electronically and then closes itself. So there's a lot of little details here that just make this super usable. Is it minivan usable? No, because of the height and you don't, you don't have the sliding doors but a lot of the utilities here, and it's a lot more hardcore, uh, and of course you have the ability to tow, which a lot of people, this is exactly what they're looking for. Now of course, utility is a big thing again. Uh, the nice thing about this is you don't have any complicated patterns of pulling cables, this, that, and the other to get the seats down. It's all electronic. There's two toggle switches here that handle that, and it handles the upward motion of the seats as well. Not only do those front seats, or this, these back seats fold down, the front seats also fold down with these two switches here. And then you hit it again, and they actually fold up, which is really awesome actually, and really handy. Now, the thing is, is they don't fold back down, you just manually go in and do it. You can actually do the other side as well. I don't even have to walk around. One of the oddest things about all the utility inside of this back, and I didn't notice it during regular use, but when I started to use this at night, there is no light back here, which is really weird because when the seats are up like this, you don't get a lot of the lighting from the LED interior. So this whole compartment is black. Most of the buyers for this car know exactly what they want. So they're not gonna nitpick a lot of the things that I would talk about. But with that said, just because I'm not this type of buyer, there was no uh, growing on me phase. I didn't have to think about it. I actually just got in this and I liked it right off the bat. Uh, it does everything and it checks all the boxes that you would expect from a vehicle like this with minimal fuss. Now, there is some accessibility issues because of its size. It is hard to get into it and out of it, depending on your height and stature. Um, it takes a little, bit of, a little bit of effort, especially if you're shorter. Like, my mom and dad cannot get in this thing. Well, 
here. This is the transfer case, but right next to the transfer case, GM has decided that they are going to add all the sound system accessories right here, and it's designated by this musical note, as you can see. We're under the 2015 GMC Yukon, and when you get underneath this car, or truck, uh, there's just not a whole lot to really look at. I mean, there's a lot of little things going on. The whole front suspension members are all aluminum. There's, again, plastic sway bar end links, huge front anti-roll bar. Uh, there, actually, there's a lot of aluminum in the front. Uh, and as you go back, you can kind of see uh, there's a little trace of aluminum here and there. Uh, big, big rear uh, drive shaft. How big is that sway bar? <laughs> Nowhere near that. 36 millimeters. 36 millimeter front anti-roll bar. That's huge. Then why not just get a minivan? Because minivans are lame. <laughs> this can tow. Yeah, but nobody, if nobody uses it to tow, what's the point? Because I don't know. I mean, this is, I mean, they put a, there's a lot of work in this thing so you could tow shit. So why wouldn't, I mean, I don't see the point of owning this thing unless you're towing. Why do people buy a Land Rover to drive around in the street with? Because it's a Land Rover? Same reason they buy this. They think it's cool. Uh, it's, this is one of those vehicles that's kind of hard because I'm actually looking at a spec sheet here. And even by the spec sheet, in terms of the marketing, there's some things that are pretty much nonsense. Uh, one of the descriptions for the suspension is it has a premium smooth ride suspension. Now, what that equates to in reality is it has rear air suspension. The shocks are, what, electronically controlled and air ride, so there's a compressor for the rear end. Mm -hmm. So the front are just traditional struts, or actually they're shock absorbers. They look like they're, no, they're shocks. Struts. What? You have to spring in the pass to it, it's a strut. That's a, that could be a shock too. See, it doesn't have. shock ha is a strut. This isn't mounted to a, uh, it's got a, it's double wishbone. The way wishbone. I always understood it, if you can drive the car without the absorber attached, it's a shock. If you can, a strut is structural. Right. It's structural. The same you can't drive that if you took it off. Well, just because it has a spring on it doesn't mean that it's not a shock absorber. Right, they're all shocks. Right, they're all but shocks. this is structural. Right, struts are, st are structural, but I guess we could have this debate all day long. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, the point was, is before we got off in this diatribe, uh, it's got double wishbone suspension in the front in wheel. The rear is air ride suspension, air, uh, air shocks. Uh, but you can see that this car has a pretty beefy chassis and there's there's clear design here to be able to tow a pretty large payload for this vehicle without having a monster pickup truck. So you can see all those little details as we pan across the, the chassis with the diff, the drive shaft, the differentials. There's there's a lot here for people that are looking to do something like that. This isn't just a, you know. You can tow sleds with this thing. You can tow sleds, you can tow PWCs, what else? Go-karts. Go-karts, yes. Sand rails. Sand rails. This, this is not like a small compact SUV that'll never tow anything. It's not like an Equinox or a CRV or something. This is legitimate. So under the hood of this thing, we have a 5.3 liter V8. It makes 355 horsepower and 383 pounds feet of torque. And uh, the car weighs 5,300 pounds. And uh, it doesn't feel that heavy at all when you're driving it. I mean, this motor really pulls. Is there anything behind the looks? Is there anything behind all of this monstrosity on the outside? And it's not until you get on the interior that all of this starts to make sense. the acceleration on this thing. I mean, it's 5,500 pounds, 5,600 pounds, and this motor has absolutely no issues propelling you to very, very quick speeds. Ride quality is 
superb. Well, you have air suspension in the back and you have double wishbone suspension in the front. Uh, it, it's just a big surprise at how well this car and how smooth it handles. Of course, it's big. You kind of expect that ride quality here, but this is the second GM I've been in now. The last was the Buick. They kind of surprised me at how well it got around corners. And for this thing, looking how monstrous it is, the electronic power steering is really good. And when you actually get on it, you can get away with things that you would never expect to get away with in this thing. I mean, I've really pushed this uh, Yukon seriously well beyond what would become anywhere reasonable. Uh, it gets around corners so well, it feels like it's a car, you know, a thousand pounds less than what it is. And there's a huge, huge uh, advantage to that in, in terms of driver confidence. Now you have to drive it a little bit differently, right? You can't just go flying through corners. You gotta get on the brakes hard before you hit the turns and then push it through. But there is rotation. You can feel that back end wanting to rotate around the corners. You know, stability control comes in, traction control comes in. But the point is, is this thing doesn't feel like you're driving a conversion van is and that's exactly what I expected it to be like it, it's not like that at all it drives very car like um, and that's something that I really like it is super important to me when I'm in a car or a truck uh, it has to have good handling otherwise I lose interest in it very fast and the fact that this is a great daily driver in terms of comfort I mean comfort is insane you can get around corners and it's fast. Well, look at that. You can get this thing to rotate. <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm stuck behind a Prius, of course, so this is a good time to uh, talk about fuel efficiency. This motor has direct injection and cylinder deactivation. Now, what that means is obviously you have uh, direct injection, which, fi which fires uh, fuel directly into the cylinders versus port injection. Uh, and the cylinder deactivation between those two are supposed to net you uh, significantly better fuel economy. So right now I'm cruising and you can tell it's in four cylinder mode because of the digital display, it says V4, uh, as it's shutting down for the cylinders. Uh, so between that and direct injection, you're going to see better fuel economy. In terms of drivability, when you're in four-cylinder mode, there's no doubt there's a little bit of surging, a little bit of hesitation that I feel. Uh, that switch over between V8 and four-cylinder mode, like here, we'll, it's almost, it's going to be seamless to 95% of the owners. I can tell what it's doing because I'm thinking about it, but if I'm just driving along, uh, there's a huge part of driving that I don't even notice that it's happening. The other thing I really like about this car is the turning circle. Uh, you would think that this thing would be impossible to get around and, well, yes, it's not exactly, <coughs> not exactly, it's not a city car by any means. You can actually get around really well. Uh, the turning radius is superb. And with all the assists, which, okay, uh, I think are really warranted on here with the, the uh, actual blind spot monitoring, it makes whipping in and out of traffic, even with its size, it makes it a breeze. I never really have to worry about if there's something alongside of me because the systems work so well. Uh, now, the lane departure warning system is really annoying uh, on this car because of the width of it. And like I'm on in rural areas where the roads are really tight, the lines are very confined. There's a very small, like right here, there's a small amount of room where you can actually veer left or right without these seats constantly vibrating. Now luckily you can defeat that system by turning it off, but uh, some of the assists on this car compared to the Buick are a little wonky. Um, there's a way that it'll actually tell you uh, when you're getting too close to the car in front of you and it will flash this LED light in front of you. It doesn't seem to be an active system, it just kind of warns you, hey, you're getting too close, idiot. You know, on normal pavement, this thing is smooth as butter. I can't imagine a better riding large car than this in a lot of respects. Yes, it still has that truck-like jarring suspension feel when you're over really rough stuff, but in terms of a road car, it just works. It works really well. Over pa 
broken pavement or railroad tracks, nothing. You want to get into stereotypes, you can't even count how many there are. But that, that's a testament to how diverse of an audience or a, a target demographic this car can reach out to. Yes, it's got the, the rapper, or the football player, the secret service stigma, the drug cartel stigma, the uh, DEA, I mean, government agencies, everybody uses this thing for different purposes. And, and that, there's a reason for it. It just works. It just works really well for what it is. There's a couple gripes I have driving it. Uh, it's kind of got a non-existent dead pedal, or it is not really a dead pedal, it's just a place to rest your foot. I find that with my size shoe and my positioning, I have a really hard time transitioning from gas to brake in a quick method. Uh, the brake pedal is adjustable, but it goes really high, really high. And I'm at the lowest position and for me to jump from gas to brake, it's still too high. I, I find myself not hitting the brake on the corner of it uh, very accurately, and sometimes I miss, which actually uh, hurts a lot of confidence I have in if I need a, a quick braking maneuver. This is really choppy pavement back here. I kind of do this on my test loop to kind of see how uh, vehicles handle over chop while still maintaining grip. Kind of hit the apex. And this, you know, this is, you can feel this thing's heavy, but it really gets through the turns very good. Brakes are really strong, really strong. But again, you have to drive it differently. You have to get your braking done right away. There's no, you know, you can't just push it through the turns uh, and expect to get around them. You got to get your braking done and then smoothly transition through the corners. talk about the Yukon's exterior, all the little stereotypes and quirks, the drivability, but really when it comes down to it, the biggest draw of this vehicle is the interior and all of the little things that it offers. If you're short, stumpy, you're going to feel like you need a mountain goat to get into this thing. It's big. Uh, but once you get over that hump, uh, in terms of interior, that's really my only gripe. Uh, once you're in the cockpit, this feels nothing like the size that it is. Storage is absurd. There's so much storage in here. It's just, there's just no excuse for it. You could fit everything in here. I mean, I, I have a couple bottles of water here. I'll just, just throw it in here for a second. I mean, you still got room for like five water bottles in here. It's crazy. This center storage, you could fit a small pet in here, and I'm not kidding. Uh, right now all I have is Action Jackson uh, USB stick, but there's so much room to put whatever you want in here. This this becomes the ultimate, uh, you know, the ultimate road trip machine. Phone storage, one thing I'd lo love to see is if they put an inductive charger in here, if your phone has an inductive charging, so you can just set it there and have a charging pad. I mean, there's a million storage compartments here, there, and everywhere, but Something dedicated that's usually up here is not there for glasses. So the question became, where is it? Where do I put it? And I consulted Marisol Patel, and she's been uh, having a lot of problems lately because of uh, she's just got a lot of indigestion from all the paneer she eats. But she did find out where I could put my sunglasses. Yes, that's a real compartment. She calls it a drug safe. I guess she's been hanging around enough rap artists, and uh, well, it was uh, this was already here from the last person, but uh, I guess it's a thing to hide stuff from the popo or store your sunglasses. There is so much room back here; it's ridiculous. You could just live out of this thing. These two seats have uh, individual seat heaters. Uh, there's climate control back here. 
uh, that is adjustable completely. There's vents in the ceiling. This back seat here that folds down could probably fit three adults uh, too very comfortably. And then of course, if you opt for this option, uh, there's LED lights here, but there is a fold down uh, DVD slash Blu-ray screen. It also plays stuff off a of USB and there's analog inputs as well as SD card inputs back here. So it's a pretty versatile en entertainment machine. Uh, and I did try some Blu-rays and DVDs and it works pretty cool. Um, this would be awesome for road trips for sure. The beauty of analog gauges, it's super easy to use and there's no menu jumping to do what you want. You have an oil pressure gauge, coolant, battery voltage, uh, your fuel, and then an analog tack and speedometer, which you know is nice here. Uh, this center LCD is super simple to read and figure out for the most part. You just kind of cycle up or down to go through the different submenus for each thing. Uh, you can see fuel economy, uh, speedometer, and all that. But here's where the confusing part is, and this is where there's a lack of manual physical control for this. If I want to control audio, I can't just do it from here. I actually have to hit left, and then I have to choose the submenu for audio. And then I can cycle through what I want on here, uh, you know, browse. Basically, this is how you control it without having a physical control. But if I want to get back to the info with fuel economy, I actually have to exit out of this again and then I have to go back to info menu which you know it, this is where I find this system to be cumbersome I don't want a menu jump to do simple tasks and I certainly don't want to be using a touchscreen while driving seat heater controls are super intuitive this covers all your back HVAC controls so you can turn it on from here adjust the temperature from here uh, you can do auto I mean it's very simply laid out all these physical buttons are very simply laid out you have dual climate control, passenger and driver, great tactile feedback, very positive feedback. All your knobs here and all these buttons are also very well laid out, which I like a lot. So once you get in here, you realize very quickly how comfortable of a cockpit this car really is. It just, it does everything right in terms of adjustability, seating position, steering wheel position. As you can see here, everything is kind of pseudo electronic. Uh, steering wheel adjustability is superb. Every car has its quirks, pros and cons, but this is the conclusion. I don't like big cars and trucks. Just don't like it. I don't get the point of it. But until I, that, you know, I got in this thing and there was no, well, getting to like it. There was no figuring it out. I got in it and I liked it right away. And that says a lot. And the core reasons why I like it is this. The handling is is shockingly good for what it is. It's 5,300 pounds. It doesn't feel like you're driving a conversion van. It feels like you're driving a car. Now granted, you're really high up, but all the dynamics from braking, suspension, handling, acceleration are its high points by a large margin. But not only that, you get into this interior and you look past the, the masculinity of how big this beast is. The interior is so well laid out. There's so much cargo room capacity. Uh, you can tow with this, legitimately tow, that you can't with normal SUVs. Um, and there's so many features in here that just take care of, I would say, almost everybody. The sound system's great. The sound deadening is superb. Um, and it just does so many things so well that if you're in the market for a big SUV, this is it. The cons. And this might not affect most people, but it bothers me. The brake pedal placement I can't get used to. The pedal's still too high even with the adjustability. The rear hatch isn't lit up in the back at night, which I don't understand. And that rear cargo shelf is a joke. You actually have to fold down the seats in the back to get any usable space, which of course is just the touch of two buttons. It's not a big deal. Um, the other thing is the center stack ergonomics. And I gotta say this again, they actually have physical controls here, which make a huge difference in how you use this, but it lacks a centralized physical control to get around the head unit quickly and easily. You have to menu jump here, or you have to fiddle with this touchscreen, and the buttons are impossible to use while you're driving. Like the, the phone dialer is a perfect example, and the media controls are a perfect example of how they need a little bit of a rethink or a physical control to get around here without having to fiddle around. Uh, the cylinder deactivation for me was pretty seamless. There was some herky jerkiness in four cylinder mode, but it's, it's something most people aren't going to notice. But I would highly recommend this vehicle. This, it's got to be, if not one of the top, pretty much the top in its class. It does that everything so well. Oh, yeah.